The Death to Delve Deep by Book Writer. Chapter 11. Sterling. This plan, so seated, sprouts one day after discerning and learning its location and relevance to a favorite flick. And while rifling through his no longer accessible guidebook for Roman Planet, Sterling, besides being the former capital and stronghold of the Scots, holds along with the w William Wallace monument a castle, Sterling Castle. It stands strong and has for centuries with countless tales of tabards and scabbards combined with the lore of the land. Sterling Castle and the bridge along with the area has more than influenced scenes seen in Braveheart. He wrote Raison d'être. So forthwith the river forth flows from its firth filled floodplains to find Stirling and her shire in central Scotland, found fronted by Flanders Moss, the great moss of the Albanach, the snow dune of Stirling, and the cursed Kars of Stirling. Ah, to be twirling to Stirling. The trip begins with a bus boarded by all the wee ones on their way to school. Each stop secures another Scottish small fry, beginning with the brood belonging to the owners of the inn. Their stance serves both the beginning and end of the bus route. On board, Rope listens to the Scottish brogue brought forth beautifully by all, the, by all the wee ones with their exuberant excitement and joy, music to the man's ear. Endeared every time the wee ones say, aye, the word the listener not only loves to hear, but to say as well. It seems as English expressions are speckled with kinspeckled. Now instead of saying thank you, he says, Cheers, as if it seems to be their way of showing not only gratitude, but also serves as a salutation. With a similar salutation, he addresses people with all right, instead of hello, the other in the afternoon greeting form. After the wee ones are off the bus by their school, the bus barrels bravely as the wild winds weather or storm. A change of buses happens at a station midway between Drimmen and Stirling. He is pleased to climb onto a double-decker thinking the top tier will provide a wonderful way to see this part of Scotland. The bus rolls on down the road towards Stirling, swinging and swaying. The driver decides to wisely woe the tow, realizing the wind now reaching gale courses will flip the sail-like height of the double-decker over onto its side. Off the bus, Grove backtracks by foot to the coach station. So do the few other passengers. They all get on board a standard-sized bus and are back on track while weathering the waves like a sway weathering the waves like sway of the bus. They arrive safely in Stirling. There he hikes up towards the castle. Stirling Castle is a Scot stronghold that towers over the town. It's mounted on a volcanic summit with sheer faced walls of lava, forming a front from would be wars. Up the windy road, rope goes through an old gateway into an even older cemetery. He strolls by the sad stones on his way up and out and through the main gates of Stirling, Stirling's formidable fortress. The wind is howling by the time Rope comes to the fort's front gates. He enters the castle's corner store and pays the seven quid. Now in good stead with his start inside Stirling Castle, caution to the wind as he heedlessly hikes up the cobblestone pathways and through the castle's enclaves, weathering the winds while repelling rains. Wow. What a wonderful sensation this would-be warrior senses walking around the parapet's perimeter walls, with a view of the land from every direction. With the wind howling hell, he holds tightly to a gravitational pull, meant to keep kin on foot and ground while the wind gust gales. Rote's a child at heart. He races into each turreted tower to peek through the tiny slits, imagining Scots scouting out the land in the same stand. He feels linked to the past, an ancient time, when the English kept the coming. Inside the castle museum, he gets a chance to look back in time and begins to be drawn into the dawn of the Scots. Rote sees by tapestry how the Scots story supposedly spawns in Scythia. The Scots are led by Scotia, a Scythian princess. They wander like Jews through the many Mediterranean melons. After moving across the broad lands of Europa, they gather in Gaul, or France, before passing the Pyrenees into northern Spain. Then they sail to Ireland, where they settle for some time, before settling in Scotland. Like in the lore of the lost tribes of Israel, the Scots find a home wherever they roam. A familiar ring or tone to their nomadic beginnings resonates with Rote. 
His childhood roots are erupting with ennui. Rote, refreshed by reflections, leaves the museum and finds his way back to the fortress wall. He can see the Wallace Monument in the distance atop a hilltop. It stands strong and sends a stronger message than any steward standing for an English king. Sir William Wallace stands on his own hilltop, apart and above the Shire of Stirling, as guardian and high protector of Scotland. I, as far as the eye can see, is seen. The view from Stirling Castle is only strained by the storm. The, stories imagines, the story imagines an embattled bridge way back in the 13th century, strong in stone, though then long in logs straddling over the River Forth. Forthwith, from the Firth of Forth, during a brilliant battle brought to bear by William Wallace, where the old device of divide and conquer captures the curly call of the wild wield of a Wallace, a Wallace, a Wallace. It brings to life Rote's raison d'etre, Braveheart. You can hear the famous line, they may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom. The line is designed to inflame, and it does. It refreshes Rote. It bullies him to be brave. Rote the brave and free can see the whole area around Stirling and her shire from the castle's ramparts. It fills him with a force to be reckoned with. It fires his imagination. Aye, it all brings home the haggis, so to speak, for the windswept poet warrior, wrote writer. The wind wails and becomes a definite, definite deterrent to remain on the walls while wrote abounds around the castle keep. Many times he can feel himself being lifted as he peers over and down the fortress walls worn into the lava, like sheets of stone. When Stirling Castle stalwart staff finds the pool a flutter, they usher him out. They are set to close down the fortress from any further visits that day, due to the gusts of gale force wind, winds breaking havoc, hazardous to both friend and foe. Grote finds the wind worrying, but wants to walk around a lot more, having only seen two-thirds of the steep stronghold so far. Unfortunately, the security guard, sensing the sincerity and the way the rook relays reasons to continue castling, insists the insurgents is for another time. The insurgent thinks, after hearing the main argument that the integrity of the structure is in jeopardy from the gale, wonders, what's a little windstorm after standing strong through so many storms and storming soldiers over centuries of war and weather? However, spotting and pocketing two pieces of stone just stormed off the structure, Rote realizes the severity of the storm. Regardless of Rote's reasoning, he's encouraged to leave quickly, and trusting the tug will walk out, Guard goes about fortifying the structure with the locking of doors and such. Still not satisfied and stopped from seeing all, Rote walks the way out evasively, ebbing in and out of every eddy of the edifice. Eventually he arrives back at the front gate, miffed at the time cut short from the fort. He leaves with thoughts to return after they refund his seven quid for the inconvenience. They let him know somehow, sensing his intentions, not to head towards Wallace Monument. For that too will be closed for the day due to gale force winds. Without further ado and an adjut, he leaves the Sterling stronghold still captivated by the captioned castle. While walking back down into the center part of Sterling, he passes a person with a shirt sporting the motto, Remember Bannockburn. It reminds him about his own need for a proper work shirt. He decides to check out some of the clothing stores for a couple of white shirts, prompted by the mother of the inn suggested some time, time ago. He finds two for 20 quid before heading back to the bus station. At the stance, he learns the return bus has already left, leaving him no choice but to board another bus heading in the same direction. 